Well, uh, we're, we're continuing an educational theme, and uh, earlier this year, the Australian Skeptics Theory, as most of you would know, are a sponsor of the Australian Museum Eureka Prizes. Um, ours are for critical thinking, and over the years, we've uh, um, awarded a number of people the prize. But we changed the rules slightly this, for this year, um, in that we were getting a lot of psychologists and a few others winning it, and uh, we thought we should broaden the uh, thing, so we we uh, open up to look at teachers who uh, use sceptical critical thinking in their teaching techniques um, to encourage children to, to think critically. And, uh, <coughs> and we were delighted that the first time we did that with the winner, which was outstandingly so. I mean, the judges unanimously selected our next speaker, and she is uh, Cheryl Capra, who's a primary school teacher from the Albany Hills School in Queensland, winner of our sceptic uh, Eureka Prize winner for this year, Skeptics uh, Critical Thinking Eureka Prize winner. And somebody who has done something rather remarkable in education, and uh, we're delighted to have her here. It was down to my height. Can everyone hear me? Um, yeah. Good. Yeah. Now, um, what I'd like to talk about, two particular aspects of um, what Barry was mentioning, and uh, I wouldn't say that it's all that remarkable because uh, there are a good many teachers working not just in Queensland but throughout Australia to do similar sorts of things in their school. And fortunately there are uh, developing uh, quite a group of them which uh, is going to make a difference to science education, hopefully. We get that, you know, to use a um, mention of, I don't know if I should mention nuclear, but, you know, critical mass of people working towards something. Um, when I arrived at Albany Hills in 1997, I worked in various aspects of education for about 38 years. I worked in education central office on a number of different projects for seven years and prior to that I worked in secondary and primary. But my education began in the primary sector so I thought I'd like to just go back to primary for a few years until I retire in 2000. And uh, I'm still teaching and I'm still at Albany Hills and I guess I'm not the retiring type. But um, that's an unrecognised pun, thank you. <laughs> that's why I, I, on that uh, astrology test I gave myself about negative five for uh, the one about good sense of humour fitting. I, I enjoy other people's jokes, I just can't make them myself. <laughs> now, um, after I arrived at Albany Hills, I settled into a class there and I wasn't doing any special role in the school, but I had a strong interest in mathematics and science, which uh, I taught in secondary school, having taught physics, mathematics and German. The uh, thing that I was interested in was what was the state of science in the school, because I knew there was a new syllabus on the horizon. I'd taken some small part in it. And I also knew that Education Queensland was working on materials that uh, they were going to use to help promote the syllabus in the schools and uh, there are also uh, source materials for teachers. I uh, anyway settled into my class and then the first religious education lesson in my classroom was an absolute revelation. I'd been away from schools too long I decided because things had changed. When I was first in schools, in primary schools in particular, there had been uh, the situation where the Uniting, or in those days, Pres uh, Methodist Presbyterian ministers would come in, Anglican ministers would come in and take children, they'd all go to their different minister. Now we had an ecumenical group in the school, which was taken by one lay person, usually, who came into the school to take them at each different year level. Benefit for the school was that it was less delay to other work for this mandatory half hour of religion and uh, the children stayed together in the one classroom. <clears throat> but what I found was that uh, it was so different to what I remembered. 
Now they are being taught nothing but stories about Daniel in the lion's den, uh, creation as it's told in Genesis, one or the other. And the thing was that this happened week after week. And I asked some teachers on the staff about it. Is this sort of thing uh, usual for RE? Oh, yes, it's really good. We get all our work marked while it's going on. We, they tell them stories, they get a chance to sing to the guitar and, and stand up and praise the Lord and so on. I said, would you mind listening carefully to what's going on? Because I think it's part of our duty of care to these kids. And they thought, oh, here's a nutter come to the school. But anyway, we'll listen. And uh, they said that they'd monitor it for a couple of weeks and get back to me. Well, we're going to have that time, staff of about 43. And uh, those 43 teachers, almost all, reported back to me that everything was fine. They're telling the kids these wonderful stories. They mentioned the stories they were telling me, and it was the same. Year after year after year, kids were getting seven years of it. And just a couple said they were concerned that uh, when they did listen to it, just what the kids were being told. So, what we uh, decided to do, I and a few other people that I discussed it with, was continue monitoring what was happening and then look at the possibility of doing something about it. Now, I'm not going to read the overheads to you, so please don't wait for me to do so. Um, I said to them, and I, by this time I had probably about five or six people out of 43 who thought I wasn't crazy. I said, let's, let's just see if there's anything that is even more sinister than just telling them Bible stories. And that didn't take long to happen because about four weeks into my uh, appointment there, the lay person who came in to take religion in grade seven, right across the five grade sevens, started telling them about scientists and science being an instrument of, not God, but the devil. <laughs> and he also said that, now, scientists think we're descended from monkeys. And in the process, he jumped around doing all the actions all around the front of the class. And he said, which would you prefer? Would you prefer to be made in the image of a wonderful, loving God? Or would you prefer to be a monkey? And he starts running around the classroom again. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Yet, it even got worse, because later on in the lesson, he said to them that all the bad things that happen to you in this life, all the diseases and, and problems that you get, they're a punishment from God. They're either a punishment from God for the things you've done wrong, or you've got the devil in you. Now, at the time, we had a child in grade 7, not in my class, who had muscular dystrophy. He was in a wheelchair, had a, a rod in his spine, and knew that his life expectancy was pretty limited. So all of the teachers in that new level were absolutely horrified. What we did was prepare a memo. They all signed it. And it started off, it's a memo to the principal from all the year seven teachers. As a matter of conscience and as a consequence of our professional duty of care to students, we feel it is imperative that we notify you of our concerns outlined below regarding the religious education course currently being implemented in our classrooms. Now, you might wonder what all of this has got to do with my implementing a total reform of science in the school. But I wanted to give you some of the background of what was going on in the school. And by the way, we did eventually get rid of this person from our school, but it took three months. And it also <laughs> took uh, conferences with the RE coordinator 
Uh, we had to get the religious education advisor out from central office, who happened to be Meg Noack, uh, Joby Ogden Peterson's daughter, uh, <laughs> when she came to talk to us. But eventually, we did get rid of him, because I enlisted the aid of the local Anglican minister, who was on the minister's fraternal. And the minister's fraternal oversees all of the uh, RE in our particular district. And they're not stacked with fundamentalists, but religious education in our school was, because the mainstream wasn't coming anymore. So I pointed out to him the problems that we were having. The other thing was that I'd done a, a guest spot in uh, grade two, uh, because they knew I was a very keen amateur astronomer. And the teachers had asked me to talk to the children about space. And I was talking to some of the young children uh, about the Earth in space and using a globe to demonstrate and some thin cellophane for blue cellophane for the atmosphere. And I said, if we, if we could get away from the Earth's pool and go through that atmosphere, where would we be? And one of them said, we'd be dead. <laughs> uh, and I thought, oh, there's someone who knows I haven't mentioned life support. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean you'd be dead? Because that's heaven up there. <laughs> and uh, there, there was a lot of belief in that up above the clouds. So I thought then, what are these children being taught in science? I decided to have a talk to the science coordinator who was proud to inform me that he and a large number of staff actually came to a charismatic church that met in the school auditorium every Sunday. And the science in the classrooms that I noted was going on was a few teacher demonstrations, experiments done as demonstrations, they um, were taken from the old source book. There was no school science program. There was also uh, the matter of teachers being, uh, well, involved in a couple of other things. The school has a high environmental profile, which it still does. <coughs> and most classes were doing, as their science, cleaning up the school dam and various other environmental projects. But that was about it. Some did some other science on a Friday afternoon if sport was cancelled because of rain. So I decided that we needed to do something and do something pretty substantial. Um, the next year, that science coordinator was transferred to what we call the Bible Belt of the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> so if there is an interfering God, She's on the side of science. <laughs> I applied for the role of science coordinator at the school and also as a science project officer for a project I had in mind, which was the total reform of science in the school. The um, actual program got underway at, by 1999. And the syllabus was then published and distributed to schools. So we have the, the official direction. It's a good syllabus, but then I had a battle with Education Queensland because of the materials they were producing. Um, and I have to thank uh, Professor Michael Archer for giving me uh, the courage and the inspiration to take on an email battle with the person in charge of that program writing because uh, there was mention in the syllabus of evolutionary processes. It was one of the key concepts of the life and living section, going right through all the strands from year one to year 10. And the materials he was producing had also incorporated looking at other ideas. So the battle went on. Um, he was promoted. At least he wasn't having any uh, input into the materials, his promotion was out of that area. And my, the quip from Mike when I told him what had happened was, um, should have been promoted to tea lady. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a gem. 
I hope you apologise to all the tea ladies. Sir. <laughs> so, we began on this project in September 1999. I produced a survey which. Um, Okay, I produced a survey for uh, staff and almost all of the 43 teachers on staff filled out this survey which looked at uh, a number of different aspects. i just read them out to you to make sure I don't forget any of them. Teachers were asked to rate against criteria their scientific literacy, confidence in teaching science from preschool to year 7, their familiarity with pedagogical issues that impinge on science learning, such as how much they use technology, such as microscopes, telescopes, um, electronic equipment, <laughs> like I'm using now. Um, <laughs> knowledge of strategies to promote students' critical thinking abilities and how they assess themselves with regard to the learning of students in their classroom, were they having an effect on the student science learning? Some of the data there, if you've been looking at it, gave an indication that we had a fairly traditional kind of school. Um, but the teachers were interested in science, a very large proportion of them. A bit worrying that 68.5% felt that they had very little or no understanding of modern science and other people have done other surveys throughout the state and now throughout Australia and that percentage is pretty well worn out. This is primary teachers we're talking about. A lot of them have studied no science all the way through their schooling. So there was something that had to be done about professional development and so whatever we did we had to incorporate development of teachers, not just in teaching science effectively and in accordance with the syllabus and a school program, which was yet to be written at this stage, but also to be able to do it in a way that they had an overall picture of where they were going, what, what sort of uh, key concepts did they want the students to be able to articulate at the end of it. And as well as the teacher's survey, I also, with the aid of a, a number of people, I've formed a committee by now of parents, teachers, some administrators, and uh, we put together a science scan for students from years two to year seven. We didn't put it into the preschool or year one. We did interview those children and, and had some anecdotal evidence, but uh, I didn't feel like trying to do a test with preschoolers and year ones, especially when most of my teaching experience had been in secondary. So um, the actual test results come through from that age group. Is someone watching the time? Because I never watch time. Just ring a bell or something, please. Um, the test section of the scan was interested in finding out exactly what the state of science was in the school, right across the school. Everyone was tested on the one day. All students in the same year level did the same test. And it was administered in the same manner in which the national competitions are administered in the school, which is absolutely strict test conditions, no input from teachers. And, uh, you know, no teachers saying, oh, Johnny, tick that one there, or something like that. So it was, was very well monitored. And what did it reveal? Uh, that's, sorry, I'm a little bit behind here. I'm going ahead of myself. Um, the, the scan revealed that analysis and interpretation of data in the school was reasonably strong. And 
the reason for this was probably that we had a lot of good maths teaching going on in the school. And they did a fair amount of, well, abs calculation using algorithms, applying formula to uh, solve problems, and graphs st and statistics. So that wasn't too bad at all. However, their attainment in critical thinking and how closely their conceptual understanding approached that of the scientific <coughs> consensus in the different uh, aspects of science were really a huge worry. Uh, I and a colleague called Irene Elder produced a report on the 2000 scan and that was discussed at staff meetings with teachers and administration so that we could see what the situation was and what our suggestions were for where we go from here. And everyone who looked at that scan data could certainly see that there were problems in the school with scientific understanding and also with the ability to think critically. The report was 52 pages long, graphs, tables, analyses, and also recommendations for what sort of changes were likely to be uh, effective. And we discussed it and collectively as a staff looked at what we were hoping to get to. Now, the project had uh, a number of particular um, objectives, I guess, which I've had on the overhead for uh, a little while. I hope you read the first one when I moved it on to the second. Um, and these were aimed at allowing us to achieve what was our overarching goal. And that goal was that we wanted students who could think critically, who would be able to apply that critical thinking not just to solving scientific problems, but use it in their everyday lives. We wanted them to be able to ask questions and to be able to analyse data and look for fallacies and look for misconceptions and be able to recognise them. So what we were hoping to do was change, I guess, the whole mindset of what was going on in the school and in children's minds, at least um, a large proportion of them. And in order to do that, the children had to learn science by actually doing science. They had to work scientifically, learn how to develop hypotheses. First of all, how to ask the questions, how to develop hypotheses, how to go about setting up a fair test. They had to understand what a fair test was and then how to record data, how to observe, and then how to analyse the results and determine if there were any variables, for instance, that uh, should have been controlled that weren't, criticise their own work, that of others, politely, of course, although they're not always. But um, it was a matter of getting them to actually act like scientists. And that's the kind of program that we wrote. The, um, the program was written mainly by Irene Elder and I with the sounding board of the <coughs> consultative committee that we'd established. And Irene was a a great one to have on board. I'd actually targeted her because not only was she intelligent, had some scientific background, she had early childhood training and uh, there was no way I could write a program for children in that early part of the school <coughs> without a lot of assistance. And another thing, she had a good sense of humour and she was a liberal Catholic. So Irene had everything that I needed to assist me with this job. And uh, it was as well, because I think a lot of the staff regarded me as a bit of an interloper. I only just arrived. 
and that uh, I was also a little bit pushy. I've heard that mentioned a few times. <laughs> and uh, the other aspect was they sort of thought I was a bit irreligious. No, I don't know how they think that. <laughs> But it was great because a lot of people who had hesitancy about me were happy to uh, come on board when Irene started promoting it as well. And uh, what we did in 2000, early 2000, was we started writing the new school program based on the syllabus. And that new school program was ready for its implementation in January 2001. Before the end of 2000, we had uh, actually laid the foundation for it with a, a whole battery of staff professional development in pedagogy and in general science. And we kicked off the, uh, the staff training with uh, astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, because that's one of my obsessions apart from science generally and I don't spend all my money on telescopes for nothing. <laughs> and, uh, the, the thing was that a lot of people came to that session, oh, this is going to be boring. And, and so many were just absolutely wrapped and quite a few said later, I had absolutely no idea of any of that. And from there, we got funding for your uh, telescopes for the school and we now have a thriving astronomy club and are uh, using the Las Campinas telescope in Chile remotely over the internet. So we've come a long way. And teachers are all involved with that. But just getting back to our program, um, based on the syllabus, with one slight difference, there's a critical thinking component which is based on the scientific method. And you might wonder why I called this um, at the beginning, that first slide, which uh, used science as a candle in the dark as the title. Um, I know Carl Sagan wasn't the originator of that, but I think of him when I hear it because I read his book, Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. And in that book, he incorporated a baloney detection kit. We rewrote that for students to use. Students from grade four to seven use the Bologna detection kit as part of their critical thinking development. They do some fair testing, a bit like what you've seen here today. And uh, we've even had them draw up contracts to test such things as levitation using psychic powers. And would you believe with one of those uh, little episodes, across grade seven. Belief in levitation and levitation, which they'd seen on some show on TV, some, uh, I can't even remember the name of it now, this is a couple of years ago, but I think it was one of those that promote witchcraft, and they'd seen this girl levitated in it, so we had a fairly large proportion of our grade sevens at that stage who were uh, convinced well, when I say fairly large proportion, it was running close to 50%, and I found that a bit horrifying. But the, uh, the fair test was uh, drawn up by the children and signed by the two groups, the believers and the non-believers. And uh, the non-believers said, look, we better get the gym mats out because if they do, if, you know, someone is up high, and we tell them to let go, if we know what's going to happen, gravity will pull them down. But uh, anyway, they had this contract signed, we did it under test conditions, and uh, of course, from I think about 49% believing that we're going to do it, dropped to less than 2%. So not just the, the, uh, the body dropped, but so, so did the belief. And, the power of doing tests like was done here today and that sort of thing it is quite phenomenal. Students are willing to listen, look at evidence, but you need to um, teach them how to look at evidence. And that's where Carl Sagan's Baloney Detection Kit comes in. 
our reworked version he may not recognise, but we have credited him with it because it is derived from his. And uh, students are introduced to scenarios and they could be implemented by me as their teacher or another teacher, a parent or a student, and the scenario is role playing. You say, look, and another person's question, so they'll do a follow up on other people's questions. They're looking for um, whether the person answering the question is drawing on some other outside circumstances instead of giving them data. And so every child is rated according to the quality of their question, the depth, the searching nature of their question, but also the follow-up questions. And being able to identify what it was, and we have a baloney detection chart up in the room, being able to identify what it was that they actually were trying to discover and whether they did discover it or not. And uh, they just loved it. But every day I ask, can we do another baloney detection scenario? <laughs> Children, as you can see, enjoy preparing them. And in order to prepare for a baloney detection scenario, they've got to have some background knowledge so they know what it's going to be about. They don't know all the details, but they know something about it. And so they do the research. They go on the internet, they research from books, research from yearbooks, all sorts of things. And they're taught to use the internet critically as well. This one of them came to me the other day and said, Mrs. Cameron, look at this garbage I just got off the net. And uh, that sort of thing is really worthwhile. It took me a long time to convince the school to let them go free on the internet. They had all sorts of bars on it. And uh, of course, they can't get to porno sites or anything, but um, they had things barred that they didn't need to bar. Kids are never going to distinguish the pseudo junk from the real thing if they have no experience with it. So we, we won that battle as well. In fact, we've won a lot of battles, I guess. But uh, it goes on. There, there's still professional development to be done. We've got new staff coming in all the time. And uh, we've had people transferred out who are accustomed to the program and working well, but they spread the message to other schools that they go to. I've also been invited onto the District Science Committee. I'm now on the District Committee of um, Stafford and Jeepa. Uh, and through that committee, I'm able to assist in promoting real science in schools throughout the two districts. Um, and now in Queensland, there is a new impetus on science. It's a government priority. and. Also, I've been heavily involved in the development of that particular um, spotlight on science at school as I took part in a presentation at the uh, conference that was organised to guide it. And then there was a state summit which involved a uh, chief scientist, a number of other scientists from Queensland universities, secondary teachers, and uh, we actually wrote the recommendations for the government. So um, things are underway, um, but we still have our problems. As something I was talking about the other day with children in uh, grade six recently, having done a um, study in studies of society and the environment, SOS, on Antarctica, and uh, when I read some of the work they've done, they, they simply had written that um, we're going to be in a lot of trouble and all underwater before too much longer because all the ice is melting and Antarctica is going to melt away. And I thought, well, we better make sure that we get into the science of that as well because I'm not too fussed about children thinking that Antarctica is going to melt in the next few years. In 2000, we did a follow-up test, and a very similar one to the one that had been done previously. And the results you see there, just the critical thinking section, um, 
indicated that something was happening. The, uh, you need to compare, say, year four, 2000 with year four, it, with year six, 2002, in order to track the same cohort of students. There were some really big gains and some that were just little gains. But once again, we did a report and discussed it, looked at recommendations that would keep us moving in the right direction. What does employee mean? That they actually employed <coughs> critical thinking, that the strategies they used, the ideas they put forward, showed that they were thinking about issues rather than just regurgitating answers that they'd learned. So I will finish very soon. Um, but where we are now, as I said, we've got children involved in astronomy and those pictures and the others I've used earlier of any space phenomena were taken by students uh, from grade three to seven. So that's eight year olds through to 12 year olds were into astrophotography and uh, the kids are so keen on science that in the uh, state science competitions the last three years we've won more prizes from our entries than any other school in the state and that's primary, secondary and P to 12 colleges. So pretty proud of that effort. Um, and in RE, getting back to religious education, um, children now ask questions in RE. And the uh, kinds of questions they're asking are really unnerving some of the fundamentalist presenters, some of who, who have decided not to come anymore. <laughs> now we've told them always to be polite, which they are, polite but persistent. Some of them I have, yes. And some are now doing a course that is quite acceptable and the Anglican minister has assisted with that in giving them a few clues as to how to go about it. So, at least now in Year 7, children aren't asking me how do Adam and Eve fit into the geologic time scale we just <laughs> talked about. And even our preschoolers in their own way, know something about the vast and beautiful cosmos beyond Earth's tiny little envelope. Thank you.